Obviously, the past few years have brought a lot of events one might label as disturbing. But after the past few days, disturbing would be an improvement. Because we're so consumed by the botched response to the pandemic and the endless examples of racial injustice, we barely have any time to focus on how the president of the United States is presiding over a failed state. So let's start with the president's current coronavirus response or lack thereof. Before his big golf trip over the weekend, the 283rd of his presidency, according to various media accounts, he held a mini campaign style rally yet again without masks, on an airport tarmac in Florida. Yes, that Florida, where more than 7,000 people have died of COVID-19, and they're dealing with one of the worst outbreaks in the country, which is really saying something at this point. And yet, this was the message delivered by the president. If you look at other countries, other countries are doing uh, uh, terribly. I think we're doing really well in Florida. Really well. Even today, he inexplicably continued to promote that flawed study on hydroxychloroquine. And over the weekend, in between golf rounds and threats to ban TikTok, Trump managed to get in a little Twitter time with more than 70 tweets and retweets between 9 p.m. Saturday and 8 a.m. Sunday alone, if you were counting. Plus this one, sent a little earlier on Saturday, refuting a CBS News post citing Dr. Anthony Fauci as saying European countries have seen a sharp decrease in coronavirus cases because most shut their economies by 95 percent, while the U.S. only shut down by 50 percent. The president's response? Wrong. We have more cases because we have tested far more than any other country. If we tested less, there would be less cases. It's actually fewer cases, Mr. President, but that's the least of our concerns, as he just keeps repeating that baseless claim, despite the fact that in Florida alone, there were just 32 positive cases per 1,000 tests in mid-May, compared to 193 per 1,000 in mid-July, which pretty much blows up that whole theory, and it's a pattern seen across much of the country. Meanwhile, Trump is doing all he can to discredit the nation's top infectious disease specialist and cheering on this nauseating performance by Congressman Jim Jordan. Can the government limit the protesting? I, I, I don't think that's relevant to... Well, to, you just said if it increases the spread of the virus, I'm just asking, should we limit it? Well, I'm, I'm not in a position to determine what the government can do in a forceful way. Well, you make all kinds of recommendations. You, no. you make comments on dating, on baseball, on everything no. you can imagine. I'm just asking you, you just said that, yeah. that protests increase the spread. No. I'm just asking you, should we try to limit the protests? No, I think I would leave that to people who have more of an, a, a position to do that. I'm telling you what it is, the danger. And you can make your own conclusion about that. Do you see the inconsistency, though, Dr. Fauci? There's no inconsistency, Congressman. I don't understand what you're asking me as a public health official to opine on who should get arrested or not. That's not my position. Great job, tweeted the president afterwards. Right to protest? Old hat. Free press? Another First Amendment inconvenience. As it turns out, the Department of Homeland Security has been monitoring some journalists in the same way they do terrorists, by compiling intelligence reports on them as they try to report on protests. And over at the Department of Defense, they have a new top policy guy who called Islam the most oppressive violent religion and once referred to Barack Obama as a terrorist leader. And of course, we can't forget Trump's continued fear-mongering and stoking of racial division, which he took to a whole new level last week when he rolled back an Obama-era program that was meant to combat racial segregation in suburban housing. There will be no more low-income housing forced into the suburbs. It's been hell for suburbia. Actually, a lot of America is going through hell right now, Mr. President. But low-income housing in the suburbs definitely is not why. And finally, on top of the news that came out today that the New York District Attorney suggested he's investigating Trump and his organization for potential bank and insurance fraud, there's that whole issue of the president looking to delay the election, as he first tweeted out Thursday morning, and has doubled down on seemingly every single day since. It's very, very unfair to our country. If they do this, our country will be a laughing stock all over the world, because everyone knows it doesn't work. This is going to be the greatest election disaster in history. You won't know the election result for weeks, months, maybe years after. Maybe you'll never know the election result, and that's what I'm concerned with. 
It'll be fixed. It'll be rigged. I, too, am concerned not about the votes, but about what this president is going to do with them. And I'm not the only one. You may have seen the stories of a bipartisan group calling itself the Transition Integrity Project, which met back in June and basically gamed out a bunch of different scenarios of what might happen if Trump refused to concede should he lose in November. In the end, not a single scenario ended well. I'm joined by two Transition Integrity Project members, Trey Grayson, former Kentucky Secretary of State, former director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, along with David Frum. David, of course, a former speechwriter for George W. Bush, now a senior editor at The Atlantic and author of two books on how Donald Trump has undermined American democracy. David, good to meet you. And Trey, great to see you again. Good to see you again, Jeff. David, if I can start with you, what was the point of these exercises other than, I assume, to raise the blood pressure of all the participants? Actually, we found the exercise a calming um, a, a calming experience, not a blood pressure raising one, okay. because knowledge okay. is power and, and preparedness is readiness. Um, but the purpose of the exercise was to be ready for unpredictable situations. I think if you cast your mind back to the year 2000 and the recount between George Bush and Al Gore, the, that we discovered there are many bumps after the people vote, between the time the people vote and the time that the inauguration takes place. Um, in 2000, I I was involved with the Bush uh, administration, of course. The Bush campaign recognized that it had a problem on its hands because it had won um, a electoral victory, but not a popular va- mandate. Donald Trump has never recognized that. In fact, he has exploited those weaknesses in the system, and the system needs to be ready for him. We all need to be ready for him. So, uh, Trey, what exactly did all of you do when you gathered together? I know it was a role-playing kind of thing. What does that mean? What did you do? So, so I think there were four or five different scenarios that they gave us, you know, a, a narrow win, a comfortable win. We actually, there was one scenario where Trump won the Electoral College, apparently, but not the popular vote. And we all played our own role. So like in each, I played two different games and I played a role of Republican elected officials. So we were supposed to think about what would senators and governors and Republican secretaries of states and even state legislators, how would they approach this fact pattern? that you were given? How would you react to the decisions of, the, of Trump and of mm-hmm. Biden and of other actors? David, actually, we played one game together, uh, and David was on the Trump team. And so he, he and his uh, colleagues tried to think about what would, how would Trump approach this particular situation? Um, and we would offer up, here's what we would do, here's why we would do it. Uh, sometimes there would be a roll of the dice, literally, to determine whether it was successful or not, and then we would proceed along until uh, Inauguration Day. So was it calming for you as well, Trey, or what? Uh, you know, I think David's right in that, that surfacing oh. these issues was good. But no, I mean, some of the stuff the Trump folks, suspect, I'm going to, David, uh, had some really creative and scary um, ideas about what the Trump administration might do. And so I don't know that I would use the word calming, but we've got months, a couple months to figure out how do we address some of the things that were surfaced. David, can you give us one of those scenarios about uh, give us a pick one and tell us what it was that you as a Trump uh, advocate did? Um, Well, one of the things that we were concerned about, of course, was the president's um, potential personal legal liability and personal business liability after leaving office. And so we would try often to um, engineer situations where we could trade off concessions in the present for advantages later. Um, I think one of the most important things I could communicate to your audience today is to say, one of the things we all agreed that was not an option is Donald Trump simply could not, quote unquote, refuse to leave after Inauguration Day. If if he is not certified by the Electoral College as the winner, at noon on Inauguration Day, he just isn't president anymore. The man with the nuclear football will walk away um, his signature on a piece of paper will have no legal validity. Um, the ch- chairman of the Joint Chiefs won't take his calls anymore. He won't be president. The hours of danger are the period from the beginning of the voting process, which is now a multi-day process, um, until the electors meet in the states. 
um, and cast their electoral votes. And that period of a little more than a month, that's where the mischief took place. And that's what we tried to, for example, in one of our scenarios, um, the attorney general actually literally tried to impound um, vote by mail ballots that he contended were fraudulent. Uh, in, uh, in other cases, we just tried to cast so much doubt on the outcome as to uh, justify protracting the process endlessly to extract concessions from the Democrats. You know, speaking of, uh, of trying to cast so much doubt on the outcome, Trey, I think it was, it was either Washington Post or the New York Times counted up 70 times in, in recent times the president has cast doubt on the legitimacy of mail-in ballots. Here is just a little smidgen of this from Friday and uh, Thursday and Friday from the president. Mail-in ballots will lead to the greatest fraud. This is easy. You can forge ballots. You guys like to talk about Russia and China and other places, they'll be able to forge ballots, they'll forge them, they'll do whatever they have to do. You know, the more I watch this, Trey, uh, examples like this, he is grooming a significant yeah. chunk of the population to be prepared for an eventuality that may not happen, but he is grooming them. Isn't that what this exercise is all about? Not yours, but his. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's a great that's a great term, great concept to describe it. And, and we see it. If you look at polling data, Republican voters say that they're less likely to want to vote by mail, even if they've been given that option. Um, and and it's, it's a problem. I mean, states like Massachusetts, um, I think, are going to allow vote by mail without an excuse for the first time. Kentucky may do yes. it again. Lots of states yeah. are doing this because we're voting in the middle of a pandemic. And so one of the things but that we want to make sure. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we want to make sure that people understand election day isn't going to be we're going to, where we're going to find out the results because so many of these states are going to have to count sure. vote by mail ballots for the first time. And they just don't have the capacity the way that states that out do this every year, like out west. Well, especially with his buddy as head of the post office. But that's exactly what I was going to ask you, Trey. You're a former secretary of state. The beauty of this, and I mean the perverse beauty, it seems to me, is even in a legitimately conducted election, we're going to have situations like the congressional counts in New York, where because all of this is so new, at least in this volume, that the, the delays are going to be built in. And it seems to me that the preposterous claims of Donald Trump during that process will seem less preposterous because people are conditioned for the fact that mail-in is going to be a more cumbersome counting process. No? No, I think I think that's right, and that's why it's important for the media, you know, you to have conversations like this to educate your audience. And I've been proud that the current Secretary of State of both parties are going on the offensive, yeah. if you will, to talk about this. You know, David, you mentioned a minute ago that the, the, the good you had good news and bad news in a recent Atlanta column, and I'm not sure which was bad and which was good. I think the good was what you mentioned, that if the electors come together and certify the votes or whatever they do on January 6th, on January 20th, what happens, happens. But you went on to say what you didn't say here. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing what you wrote in The Atlantic, is that Trump nevertheless will leave a poisonous trail behind him or some such thing. What exactly is the poison that concerns you? Well, he, he, here's, I think, the thing that worried about us. One of the things in, in one of our scenarios at my group, and I'll only speak for myself because while the results of the exercise are public, the names of who said what are, are, are confidential. Um, but but what we were playing, what we began to play for was to reshape the electoral map of the 2020s for re Republican advantage. Um, the last time the Democrats won big, 2008, um, was not, of course, a census year. And the Republicans did well in the congressional elections and the state elections of 2010. And so it was Republicans who got to do the redistricting in 2011. What Republicans and the Trump people have to face in 2020 is if Donald Trump loses and if those, ballot, those losses are felt down the ballot, it's not just the presidency or even the Senate that is at stake. It is the whole shape of the American political map for the next 10 years. And so to create an environment in which at the state and county level, um, Republicans can then convince themselves that they're entitled to do anti-majoritarian things to hold advantages. Yeah. That's that's where the real problem is. And that we, we may be witnessing in the 2020s without Trump the QAnonization of American politics. Right now, think of it this way. So right now, people are, liter are literally get shooting people to try to tell them to wear masks. But at least every other day, 
someone from the Trump administration somewhat agrees that people should wear masks. What happens when it is a Biden administration and Democratic state governments that say masks and QAnon type Republicans with guns say no, and they are then amplified by state level Republicans who try to mobilize their intensity in order to make sure that North Carolina and Georgia remain solid Republican states? So, uh, gentlemen, I only have a minute left, so I'll divide it up, starting with you, David. Other than the, edu the public education that hopefully you and people like me are providing about this possibility and the fact that I'm sure the Biden campaign is preparing as best as they can, what else can be done between now and November 3rd to make these nightmare scenarios less real, David, starting with you? The Biden people have to be less legalistic and less conventional in their thinking. That was their weakness in all our scenarios, was the legalism and conventional thinking of the Democratic teams. How about you, uh, uh, Trey? What's your, uh, uh, what's your hope or what's your, uh, what's your project projection here? Well, you know, what we talked about earlier with making sure people understand we're probably not going to know the results on election night unless there's a large margin. And also that the Biden campaign needs to be prepared to not get assistance during transition and that it could be a, sh you know, a shorter period of time. They're going to have to do this on their own. Um, the Trump campaign didn't take their own transition very seriously. There's no reason to think that they'll take uh, a transition to the Biden administration seriously as well. So hopefully they'll plan accordingly. Trey Grayson, thanks. And David, while your blood pressure may be down, mine is up as a result of these last 10 minutes. Good to see you both. Gentlemen, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good to see you again.